Good morning and welcome to the adult Bible study offered by St. Cloud Presbyterian Church. Uh, today's lesson is entitled Preaching to Enemies and we'll be looking at the third chapter of the book of Jonah. Uh, if you want to get a head start on next week, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 34. You know, back in 1993, the comedy film Groundhog Day was released. That film was going to become somewhat of a classic. In the film, Bill, Bill Murray plays a TV weatherman named Phil. Notice the irony here. The groundhog is also named Phil. Uh, Punxsutawney Phil, to be exact. Well, Phil seems to always get stuck with the job of co covering the ceremonies in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, as Phil the groundhog comes out and tries to find his shadow every February the 2nd. Since Phil is a serious weatherman, he hates covering what, a story about what he calls the, that weather forecasting rat. Well, in the movie, this is the fourth year that Phil has been forced to cover this story, and he makes no effort at all to, to cover up his disdain. He feels that doing this is beneath him, and he'll be very glad when it's over. But when he wakes up the next morning, he finds out that it's Groundhog Day all over again. And every morning after that, he wakes up to find out that it's still... He's still reliving Groundhog Day. At first he uses this to his advantage, but it isn't long before he realizes that he is doomed to repeat this day throughout eternity unless he can discover a way to stop it. He is in the same place watching the same people doing the same things over and over again. Well, he eventually learns from his experiences and he uses this opportunity to do the right thing and to cover the story the way it was supposed to be covered. As a result, he escapes reliving that day. Well, Jonah chapter 3 represents Jonah's Groundhog Day. It's his chance to rerun that faithful day when he left his home in Gath Heifer and he began his long defiant walk to Joppa in order to avoid obeying God. And after a little coaxing, he decides to finally do the right thing. Have you ever found yourself trapped in a situation that you can't seem to get out of? Did you find yourself making the same mistakes over and over again? Does it seem that you just can't overcome your past? Well, Jonah is a book about opportunity after failure. More often than not, we're, we're uh, harder on ourselves than God is. We feel that our past sins disqualify us from service. But if God says that he'll forgive the sins that we have genuinely repented of, who are we to say that they're not truly forgiven? Now, I'm going to begin today by telling you how the story ends. The book of Jonah leaves us hanging. The Bible doesn't really tell us if Jonah actually got to the point where he was glad that God had been merciful to the people of Nineveh. But we do know one thing for sure. As Christians, God expects us to be just as merciful to other people as he is to us. But because we have a sinful nature, we find it very difficult to have mercy on people that we don't particularly like. But fortunately for us, we have something today that Jonah didn't have. We have Christ. And we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to help us by uh, being compassionate and forgiving. You see, even when people have been unusually hard on us, we have no ex uh, excuse for acting unloving toward them. We are, uh, we are to never give up hope that they will come to God and be forgiven someday. And if they genuinely repent, we have no right to require them to meet certain conditions before we have compassion on them. If we are true Christians, we're going to display that sort of love that God displays because we have God's love within us. We will show compassion and forgiveness to other people because God has shown compassion and forgiveness toward us, and will do it unconditionally and unselfishly regardless of how they may have treated us in the past. Well, the reason that we do that is because that is what God did for us. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Well, this week's lesson emphasizes the need for God's people to exhibit compassion and forgiveness toward other people. Unfortunately, our story demonstrates these characteristics through the fact that they were conspicuously absent from Jonah's life. In fact, Jonah actually got angry when God chose not to incinerate the Ninevites. He was upset because God had actually chosen to forgive these evil people. God was showing compassion, and Jonah just couldn't handle it. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the world today who are just like Jonah. It's much easier to seek revenge than it is to seek reconciliation. It's much easier to harm than it is to show compassion. And it's much easier to hate than it is to forgive. 
Well, that's true because it's our, it's our sinful, in our sinful nature, we want something bad to happen to someone that we don't particularly like. Some people will even go so far as to cultivate their anger. By doing that, they think that they'll be able to savor God's judgment when he finally comes uh, to these evil people. Instead of having compassion, we can't wait to see them get what's coming to them. But Jesus said, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, if we are the, uh, if you are one of the people who displays anger rather than love, you aren't a Christian. And the people who profess Christ but then don't love people are the reason why a lot of people won't come to Christ. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not ruling out righteous anger. Even Jesus was angry when he drove the money changers out of the temple because they were defiling his father's house. But unrighteous anger manifests itself in the refusal to forgive and the need for revenge. Others will exercise their pride. They're proud of the fact that they show up in church every Sunday morning, and they look down their noses at anyone who doesn't do that. They aren't interested in seeing other people saved. They like things just the way they are. See, we tend to forget that we were once just like them, and someone wanted to save us and presented the gospel to us. So why should we refuse to do the same thing for someone else? You see, they, they look at the church as being some sort of exclusive club for good people, and they see themselves as good people. They look at God as if he has an obligation to minister only to them. Unfortunately, that's how most Jews felt in Jonah's day. So instead of working toward the salvation of other people, they actually do their level best to keep these people out of the church because they're afraid that new people might mess things up for them. I've met people right here in this church who look at any new face with great suspicion. They act as if that person has invaded their exclusive territory. In fact, the first time we attended this church, a lady who will, who will remain nameless came up to us and told us that we had to move because we were sitting in her seat. People like that seem to feel that church attendance is by invitation only and any new people will show up uh, or uninvited party crashers. But the key here is this. We need to stop focusing our attention on the harm that people may have done to us. If we'll do that, it's much easier for us to see the fact that we are just like them at one time. We needed a Savior to forgive us just as much as they need a Savior to forgive them. God didn't save you because you, there was something special about you. All we are is beggars who are telling other beggars where to find the bread of life. See, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you are now able to do something that you never could have done on your own. You can have compassion on the people who have hurt you, and you can forgive them. Unfortunately, that was something that Jonah just never seemed to grasp. Now, what is the first thing that pops into your mind when someone mentions the story of Jonah? Well, if you're like most people, you think about a whale. I've even seen on the Sunday school material that call this scripture passes the story of Jonah and the whale. But the Bible doesn't say that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. The Bible says the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Whales are not fish. They're mammals just like we are. The Hebrew word uh, that was used here is dag. It refers to anything that swims by moving its tail back and forth. But a whale swims by moving his tail up and down. So dog was usually ref used to refer to a fish. The Hebrew word that was used to refer to a whale was tanin. But that word refers to a lot more than just whales. The root word is tan. And tanin is just the intensive version of that word. In other words, it, it refers to a big ton. Little definition of tanin is elongated land or sea monster. And it's most often translated with the word dragon. So even though the Hebrews use the word to refer to whales, we can't assume that this word always referred to whales. The translators of the English, uh, King James Version translate whale because it was the biggest sea creature that they knew of. The English Standard Version translates it sea monster in Job chapter 7 and dragon of the seas in Ezekiel chapter 22. Well, this is only the first of many misunderstandings concerning this little book. You see, there are a lot of people today who write off anything supernatural, and a lot of them are standing in pulpits every Sunday morning. These people feel that the supernatural events that are recorded in the Bible are simply the accounts of naturally occurring events that were written down by people who didn't understand what they were looking at. So anything that they couldn't understand, they just accredited to some supernatural source. 
But the people who think that way are ignoring one important fact. These ancient people were not stupid. They could distinguish between things that happened naturally and things that didn't. In fact, in many cases, their very existence depended on it. But today we tend to equate a lack of technology with a lack of intelligence. They forget that these ancient people were intelligent enough to do pretty amazing things that we can't even duplicate using our modern technology. So in my opinion, technology has really dumbed us down in a lot of ways. One classic example of this can be seen at every cash register in town. Now that we have calculators to figure out everything for us, most cashiers can't make change for a dollar without the help of a machine. I read a story a few weeks ago about a man who went through a drive through window at McDonald's and his bill was $4.25. Well, when he got to the window to pay, he gave the cashier a $5 bill and a quarter. She said, you gave me too much money. And then he explained to her that he had done that so that she could give him a $1 bill as change. Well, she couldn't figure it out. She actually ended up calling the manager over and he gave the man the quarter back and said, we can't do it that way here. In other words, he couldn't figure it out either. Then I think of my grandfather. Since he had to work on the farm to support the family, he never went to school. And he never learned how to read and write. But you don't dare fool him when the facts and figures were involved. He had a built-in calculator right in his head, and he never seemed to forget anything. Well, the people who don't believe in the supernatural try to come up with some sort of natural explanation for the supernatural events that are recorded in the Bible, and sometimes it's easier to take the Bible at face value than it is to believe the convoluted explanations that these liberals come up with. But in order to eliminate God's supernatural intervention from the story, they just assume that Jonah's fish must have been a whale because a whale is the only thing that has a mouth big enough to swallow a man. Unfortunately, most whales eat very small marine life, so they don't have a throat that's big enough to swallow a man. Well, there are two types of whales found in the Mediterranean Sea. There's the Mediterranean fin whale and the Mediterranean sperm whale. The fin whale feeds on krill and small fish. Even a large fin whale only has an esophagus the size of a basketball, so there's no way for it to even swallow a man. And even though a lar very large sperm whale might be able to swallow a man, the Mediterranean variety tends to be much smaller than the ocean-going cousin. So swallowing a man wouldn't be possible. There was one report in the 19th century of a sailor named James Bartley who fell off a whaling ship near the Falkland Islands and was swallowed by a sperm whale. Well, the crew managed to catch the whale a few hours later, and when they cut it open, out popped Bartley. But that story was later proven to be false. It seems that there had never been a man named James Bartley on the, the ship in question, and the ship in that story was not a whaler. And the wife of the ship's captain said that the story was a fake and it was invented by a group of bored sailors. But even if we assume that the story was true, a sperm whale has four stomachs like a cow, and each one is filled with digestive enzymes and there is no air. So a person couldn't last three hours inside a whale, much less for three days. Besides, the Bible specifically says that it was a fish and not a whale. So I have no reason to believe that it wasn't a fish. After all, God created the entire universe, so I'm sure that he could be just as capable of creating a fish with a mouth that's large enough to swallow Jonah, if that's what he had in mind. Well, after a three-day seminar in the bottle, belly of that big fish, Jonah is ready to reconsider his call. I know the three days of looking at a fish from the inside would do that for me. And when Jonah finally decided to do what God told him to do, the fish vomited Jonah up on the beach. You see, three days with Jonah in his belly even made the fish sick. A question the seminary professor loved to ask our students is, was that big fish more relieved to be rid of Jonah than Jonah was to get rid of that big fish? Well, as Jonah is sitting on the beach picking the seaweed out of his hair, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city and call out against it the message that, that I tell you. Nineveh was a very important city in the Assyrian Empire, and Jonah was the perfect example of the way the Israelites saw themselves in those days. They felt that since they were the chosen by God, he was to care exclusively for them, and he didn't care about anyone else. Maybe Jonah should have read all the nations of the earth, part of Genesis chapter 18, verse 18, chapter 22, verse 18, and chapter 26, verse 4.
Even so, Israel had a, a good reason for would want God to protect them from the Assyrians. Assyria was a very powerful nation at the time, and they were in the, the world's only superpower. And the king of Nineveh was the royal uh, was in the the city of Nineveh was the royal residence of the king of Assyria. Well, in about 780 B.C. When Jonah was called by God to go there, Assyria's most coveted prize was Egypt. But Egypt was in the west, and there were several smaller nations on the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea that were in the way, including the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So these two kingdoms uh, lived in constant fear of an attack of, uh, by the Assyrians. Well, Nineveh was massive, and its inhabitants had a reputation for violence and cruelty. So, since the entire known world at that time lived in constant fear of the Assyrians, Jonah felt that the world would be a much better place if the Assyrians were destroyed. So he didn't want to lift a finger to save them. In fact, he even criticized God for even wanting to save them. Well, ultimately, Israel's fear of Assyria was justified. The Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. They destroyed the city, capital city of Samaria and they carried most of the population back to Assyria as captives. Well, the Assyrians relocated other people that they had conquered into that area, and as well as Assyrian soldiers who were there to keep order. And boys will be boys, and girls will be girls, so the remaining Israelites intermarried with these foreigners, and the result was a hybrid group known as the Samaritans. The Bible doesn't tell us much about the Assyrian invasion of Israel. Even historians don't talk about it very much. But we have no reason to believe that the Assyrians didn't commit atrocities on the people that they captured. I mean, after all, they did it everywhere else they went. Well, all of that would happen after Jonah's time. Even so, he certainly wanted to avoid doing what God told him to do. So he headed in the opposite direction and figured that he'd hold out somewhere where God couldn't find him. Well, this is Jonah's Groundhog Day experience. It is, it's as though the events of the recent past had never happened and God is starting all over again by giving Jonah the same call that he had given him in chapter 1. The only thing that God left out was Jonah's father's name. I guess God didn't want to embarrass Jonah's father by reminding the world that Jonah was his son. Well, given the way that Jonah had been acting, it's a wonder that God wouldn't, would speak to him at all. After all, Jonah had turned his back on God. And now that Jonah had confessed his sins and returned to God, God can now speak to Jonah again. One of the tests of our relationship with God is this. Does God speak to me as I study and ponder his word? If if we don't hear God speaking to us in our hearts, maybe we've got some unfinished business that needs to be settled with him. George H. Morrison described the victorious Christian life this way, It's a series of new beginnings. Whenever we fail, the enemy tries to convince us that our ministry is over and there's no hope of recovery. But our God is a God of second chances. Micah wrote, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be light to me. You see, you don't have to read very far into the Bible to know that God forgives people and restores them to ministry. Abraham fled to Egypt, and then he lied to the Pharaoh by telling him that Sarah was his sister, not his wife. But God gave him another chance. Jacob lied to his father Isaac when he uh, was impersonating his brother Esau, but God forgave him and used him to build the nation of Israel. Moses killed a man while he was in Egypt, but God called him to lead his people out of Egypt. Peter denied even knowing the Lord three times, but Jesus forgave him. <clears throat> now, don't misunderstand this. No matter how encouraging these examples of God's forgiveness may be, they should never be an excuse for sinning. Anyone who feels that it's okay for them to sin because God will forgive them anyway has no understanding about how awful it is to sin against a holy God. But the psalmist wrote, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. God in his mercy forgives our sins. But even if he forgives us, God in his government has determined that we are going to reap the consequences of our actions, and that harvest can be very costly. God forgave Jonah, but Jonah paid it dearly for his rebellion against God. 
Well, even though we know that Jonah was rebelling, we also know that God never le left him. God is more concerned about his workers than he is about the work. You see, if the workers are what they should be, the work will take care of itself. Throughout the time when Jonah was rebelling, God was displeased with him, but he never deserted him. God is the one who controlled the storm. God is the one who made the fish. And God is the one who protected Jonah while he was inside that fish. His promise is, I will never leave you or forsake you. We don't know exactly where Jonah was when the fish tossed him up on the beach. The majority opinion is that it was on a beach in Samaria. That would put him about 550 miles from Nineveh. So assuming that Jonah could, never, could, could cover about 15 miles a day, it would take him about six weeks to reach Nineveh. And since we can assume that Jonah wasn't in any big hurry to get there, it may have been even longer. It's also possible that some time had passed and Jonah had already been walking toward Nineveh for a while before God spoke to him again. Some people say that Jonah would, had returned to his home in Gath Hefer when God called him the second time. The minority opinion is that the fish took Jonah on a long journey of about 1,500 miles around Asia Minor through the Black Sea all the way to the uh, beach uh, north of Nineveh. Well, see, I'm in that minority group. It makes sense to me that that's where the fish was going all the time that Jonah was inside of him. Even then, that would still leave about 350-mile trip to get to Nineveh. The bottom line is this. We really don't know where Jonah was when God spoke to him the second time, but regardless of where Jonah was, the point to see here is that God is the God of second chances. I can vouch for that because he's given me more chances than I ever deserved, and that's very comforting to know. You see, if, if you're one of God's children and you sin, you can come back to him. John wrote, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is going to hold on to you no matter what happens. Jesus said, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. That verse refutes what the people who think that you can lose your salvation are teaching. You see, God wasn't making an exception for Jonah. That's the way he acts with all of us. But you better be sincere when you do come back, and you better be committed to obeying him. Charles Spurgeon once said, Faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He who obeys God trusts God, and he who trusts God obeys God. But when God first called Jonah to go to Nineveh, he didn't trust that God, that God knew what he was doing when he offered to extend his mercy and give these pagans an opportunity to repent. Well, we can't assume that Jonah had changed his basic prejudices about the Ninevites when the second call came. But God is giving Jonah a chance to rethink his first response. He's giving Jonah a chance for a do-over. Now, notice that God isn't depending on Jonah to come up with the message. He says, and call, call out against it the message that I tell you. Apparently, God was going to wait until Jonah got to Nineveh before, before he would tell him what to say. Well, Jonah reacts a little differently to his call, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Then the writer adds this footnote. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days in breadth. The city of Nineveh was established by Noah's great-grandson, King Nimrod, shortly after the confusion of languages happened at the Tower of Babel. It was located near what is the modern-day city of Mosul in Iraq. Nineveh was named after the goddess Ninshi, that was uh, the Assyrian name for the Babylonian fertility god Ishtar. She was sometimes also called Nineveh. Nineveh achieved its great, greatest glory during the reign of King Sennacherib. He built great buildings and parks in the city. He also expanded the city walls, and he created a very elaborate water system. Nineveh was surrounded by five walls and three moats. Each of the walls was 100 feet high and 30 feet wide. It was probably the largest city in the world at the time. Jonah even says that it would take a man three days just to walk around the perimeter of the city. The fact that the city of Nineveh was predicted, uh, the fall of the city of Nineveh was predicted by the prophet Nahum and Zephaniah. And in August of the year 612 BC, the city fell to the combined forces of the Babylonians, Medes, and Scythians. That happened several decades after Jonah's visit. Well, after the city fell, it was never rebuilt. It was just allowed to crumble away into ruins. 
Well, when Jonah arrived at Nineveh, verse 4 says, Jonah began to go into the city, going to a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, I wonder why the Ninevites even listened to him. And after all, Nineveh was a Gentile city, and Jonah was a Jewish prophet. Well, first off, God had already prepared Nineveh to receive Jonah's message. Between 772 and 758 B.C., riots and rebellions were breaking out all around the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians had also lost a few major cities to the kingdom of Uratu between um, 760 and 750 B.C. All of these threats to the stability of the Assyrian Empire had made the Ninevites a little nervous about their future. There was also some natural events that occurred during that time, and these events were, had certainly gotten their attention. There was a violent earthquake sometime between 772 and 758 B.C. There was a famine that lasted from 765 to 759 B.C. And there was a total eclipse of the sun on June 15, 763 B.C. And many people saw things like that as a sign of divine anger. Throw all those things together, and the Ninevites were ready to believe that the gods were angry at them. <clears throat> then there was Jonah himself. If anyone to see that big fish toss Jonah out onto the beach, I'm sure that the news uh, has spread pretty fast. That may explain why Nineveh, Ninevites accepted him as a prophet. Also, I'm sure that three days inside of that fish changed Jonah's appearance. Jonah may have looked like death warmed over, and in a way he was. Remember, Jonah had died when that fish swallowed him, but God had brought him back to life just before that fish spit him out on the beach. Third, there was a fish itself. I'm sure that the people had asked Jonah about his appearance, and he told the people that he had been spit up on the beach by a big fish. Well, the main goddess of the people of Nineveh was Ninshi, and since Ninshi was also the goddess of fishing, she was often depicted with a cuneiform writing by a fish with, a, uh, with an enclosure. So, th their main goddess was the fish goddess named Ninshi. Also, their main god was Dagon, and Dagon was half man and half fish. So they figured that their gods must have had something to do with Jonah's encounter with that big fish. So all of those things worked together to get Jonah an audience, and this made Nineveh a prime candidate for revival. Well, what about today? How can we spot prime candidates for revival today? Well, think about these statistics for a moment. The fastest growing religion in America today is Islam. That's a sad thing to have to say about a Christian nation, isn't it? The state of Hawaii has as many Buddhists as it has Christians. And there are more Christians martyred today than there were during any other time in history. Well, what is the rate at which the average Christian invites someone to come to church today? Well, on average, American Christians will invite someone to church one time every 28 years. You see, the United States is just as much a missionary field as in any third world country in the face of the planet today. But, as Paul Harvey once said, we've strayed from being fishers of men to being keepers of the aquarium. We're content to lock ourselves in our air-conditioned buildings for one hour a week and talk to one another. Then, we'll go home and live the rest of the week as though we had never set foot in a church. We try to keep our Christianity a secret from the people around us so that our unbelieving neighbors don't think that we're religious nuts. Well, Jonah certainly wasn't going out of his way to make sure that his mission was a success. He was only three, uh, there because he didn't want to end up on that fish again. In fact, Jonah actually wanted his mission to fail, and he was very upset when it didn't. So I doubt that Jonah was in any, in any big hurry to get there, but God had convinced Jonah to go to Nineveh, and even so, his heart wasn't in it. You see, even though it was God's desire for Ninevites to repent, Jonah only preached destruction. In Hebrew, his sermon was only four words long. Arboim om nim de hochfach. It's translated into eight words in English. Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah didn't bother to tell them that God was a compassionate God. He didn't try to encourage them to repent and seek God's mercy. <clears throat> he didn't even put the thus says the Lord in front of what he said. He just told him and said he was going to be destroyed in 40 days in the sermon. And he did that in spite of the fact that he knew that it was God's desire for the Ninevites to repent and be forgiven. So Jonah didn't exactly preach a happy message. 
He simply told the Ninevites that our city was going to be destroyed in 40 days. It was the Ninevites themselves who figured out that it was what uh, it was Jonah's God who was giving them the warning. You know, Jonah's not alone in this. We all tend to put our own agendas ahead of God's agenda. We're willing to do God's work, but only as long as it suits our purposes, and it doesn't require any real effort on our part. How often do people do things for God, and they re but they re really have their benefit in mind? Many people send money to these prosperity gospel preachers with the expectation to, of God returning it to them with interest. How about the pastor who waters down a sermon so that he doesn't step on anybody's toes? He does that because his purpose is more important to him than God's purpose. He wants to enhance his own reputation when he should be trying to bring people closer to God. Or how about the rich businessman who gives money to the church because of the tax advantages and not because he really wants to see God's uh, work carried out. See, what they're doing is good, but in both of these cases they have put their own agendas ahead of God's agenda. I'm sure that every one of us can point to something that we claim that we are doing for God, but we're actually putting our own plans above God's plans. But Paul wrote, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your, so your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord, rather than for men. In everything we do, we must put God's desires ahead of our own desires and not just do the things that suit us. But as incredible as it may sound, here we have God's prophet actually withholding information from the people that God has called him to preach to. Jonah tells them that they're going to be destroyed in 40 days. And he neglects to tell them that they can repent and be saved. <clears throat> Whenever we wonder why there isn't a revival coming to our town, I can't help but wonder what sort of message we're delivering to the world today. Out of a misguided desire to be liked, the modern day church tends to water down God's requirements as well as the threat of God's judgment. There are far too many people in the church today who are, are more than willing to tell unbelievers that they're going to go to hell, but they never tell them that they can repent and be saved. Some of them feel that what they uh, say isn't really going to matter anyway. But the message of Jonah is that anyone can be used by God if they're just willing to deliver his message. Thank God that he works in spite of us. Well, here we have Jonah. He's walking in through the city of Nineveh, and he's crying out that God would destroy the city in 40 days. With a message like that, you can see that Jonah wasn't in Nineveh to win any popularity contest. To the people of Nineveh, he must have looked like one of these kooky cartoon guys walking around with a sign that says, The end is near. Nobody's going to pay any attention to him. But look at what happens in verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Several great events are recorded in the book of Jonah, but one of the greatest is the tremendous response that Jonah's message received from the people of Nineveh. God gave the people of Nineveh a 40-day grace period, but they didn't need that long. We get the impression that from the very first time that they saw Jonah or heard his warning, they paid attention to what he was saying. <clears throat> well, the word spread all over the city, and as a result, the people humbled themselves by fasting and wearing sackcloth. It would seem that in spite of Jonah's best efforts to conceal God's message, the people of Nineveh listened anyway, and they got it. And even though Jonah didn't, uh, hadn't told them to do it, every man, woman, and child in the city repented, and they asked Jonah's God to forgive them. This has to be the greatest evangelistic harvest of all time. Here we have one man preaching a half-hearted sermon for one day, and the whole city repents. And remember, this was the largest city in the world at that time. Nineveh had a population of about 600,000 people. Nothing else in Scripture comes even close from a human's perspective, the whole undertaking sounds ridiculous, especially when you consider the fact that Jonah was preaching a message of judgment. How can one man possibly reach out to over half a million people all by himself? Especially when you consider the fact that his, his heart really wasn't in what he was doing. I mean, after all, Jonah was a Jew. He didn't worship the same God that the Assyrians did. He could, how could he possibly get these idolatrous Gentiles to believe what he was saying?
But Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now to Jonah's credit, for all he knew, he might have ended up being impaled on a pole or skinned alive. Assyrians were famous for doing that to people they didn't like. But he went to Nineveh anyway. And the result is we have a tremendous response to a really flaky preacher. But you know, we can do that too. The only thing that God requires of us, any of us to do is to believe him. And then we must do what he tells us to do. Any success we may have is up to him. And then don't assume that we're going to see the results right away. The fact is we may not see the results at all. God sent a lot of prophets uh, to Israel before the Babylonian exile, and not one of them uh, had, any, had the attention paid to them. But they were sent so that Israel could say that they weren't mourned. They couldn't say that. All we need to do is make sure that we're doing what God wants us to do. If we'll do that, then whatever result we see is God's will. And God promised that us that no matter what the result is, God will use it for good for anyone who believes. What does he ask us to believe? Really isn't much. Just believe what he has done for you. And you start by admitting that you are a sinner that has nothing at all to offer God. Then you throw yourself on his mercy and ask him to forgive you. Do you believe that Christ took your sins on himself and then paid the penalty for your sins by dying in your place? Do you believe that he rose from the dead and is in heaven right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you? Do you believe that he's coming back someday to judge the world? Then go out and tell other people about what God has done for you and how they can have him do the same thing for them. Well, the people of Nineveh believed God, and that's all he asks from us today. But a lot of people seem to feel that the only thing that's involved in that is a profession that you believe that God the Father and Jesus the Son actually exist. But somebody professing Christ will never save anyone. I mean, Satan and the demons do that much. Possessing Christ is what brings salvation. So what does it mean to say that the Ninevites believe God? Well, faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. But was their repentance genuine? If it was, it obviously didn't last long. It wasn't long before the Ninevites reverted to their old behavior. Their revival was so short-lived that uh, other than this record in the Bible, there's no record that it ever happened. The impact of their revival was so short-lived that a century later, Nahum predicted the the destruction of Nineveh, and the fact that no record uh, of this revival exists isn't unusual. I'm sure that future generations of Assyrian scribes would want to erase any record of what they see as an aberration because they would look at it from a pagan point of view. But how could the effects of this revival fade so quickly? Well, that isn't surprising either. I mean, even though their repentance was genuine, there was no doubt that it it would fade. Look at the history of God's chosen people. I mean, God had blessed Israel with a far greater revelation of himself than Nineveh ever had. But their loyalty to the Lord was usually very short-lived. So in the pagan environment, it isn't, it isn't impossible to suppose that the changes in Nineveh would fade away after 20 or 30 years, or maybe even less. Modern-day churches are filled with people who are just as busy as they can be. They attend seminars, they form committees, and come to meetings. And someone once said a, group, a committee is a group of people who waste hours keeping minutes. They'll do good deeds. They'll say that they love Jesus. They'll do all the right churchy things. They'll use all the right churchy cliches. And, but they've never actually come to know God. And if you don't know God, then whatever they try to do for God will never amount to a hill of beans. Well, when Nineveh repented, God started blessing them again. But future generations would start talking about blessing for, or taking their blessings for granted and forget, uh, forget the source. At any rate, at least for the moment, there was a profound change in Nineveh that altered their behavior. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Sackcloth was a very thick, coarse cloth and was usually made from goat hair, and it was usually worn by very poor people. You see, goat hair clothes were very coarse and scratchy, and they were very uncomfortable. Rich people usually wore clothes made of cotton or silk. But in those days, people would put on sackcloth as a sign of humility and mourning. 
in this case, that it wasn't limited to just a few people. Everyone in the city did this. That must have created a shortage of sackcloth. Now, at this point, the story gets sort of funny. Look at verses 6 to 9. <clears throat> the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through, through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God, that everyone turn from his evil way, and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent, and turn from his fierce anger, so that we may not perish. It wasn't long before the people in the palace noticed that everyone was wearing sackcloth, and they said out to find out why. Then the people told them about the flaky prophet named Jonah who told them that they had 40 days to get their act together. Well, they reported this to the king. It was probably Esardan II. He was a contemporary of Jeroboam II of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, normally the people will do what the king does or they'll at least do what he tells them to do. But here we see the opposite taking place. The people hear Jonah's message and then they run to the king. Now, let's look at this for a moment. The Assyrian king has been looking at the northern kingdom of Israel as a good place to conquer. And eventually, that's exactly what happened. The northern kingdom of Israel was overthrown by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., and it was never rebuilt. So, here we have the enemy. But one lowly Jew comes in, and he knocks off the whole nation. They all repent and start worshiping God, at least temporarily. Don't ever underestimate the power of God. Don't ever say, but I'm only one person. What can I do? Never underestimate what God can do through one life. I'm always amazed by some of the silly things that people will do in their efforts to placate God. I heard a story a few years ago about Pope John Paul II using a whip, used to whip himself with a belt several times a week in an effort to please God. Well, as soon as the king heard that Jonah had, what Jonah had said, he threw off his robe and put on sackcloth. And then he went even farther than the people did. He went outside and sat down on an ash heap. This was a sign of deep repentance in those days. But it didn't stop there. He issued a decree that every person in the kingdom must do the same thing. And this decree was also supported by all those nobles. And he didn't even stop there. The king ordered that even the animals were to wear sackcloth and fast. Can you imagine a reaction you would get from the ranchers in this area if they got a letter from the Department of Agriculture telling them to dress their cattle in sackcloth and stop feeding them? Well, this pagan king of Nineveh knew exactly what God had in mind. And he had no doubt that God could do exactly what Jonah had said he could do. He had heard all the stories about the great miracles that the God of Israel had performed in the past. So he had no doubt that the God of Israel had the power to destroy them if he wanted to. And this pagan king had the reputation for being a cross-dressing homosexual. He was the epitome of everything the Jews despised. But he figures out God's purpose right away. Even though Jonah had failed to tell the king to repent, he instinctively knew that that's exactly what God wanted him to do. And this is one of the best examples I know of, of God's sovereign election at work. The Kings also understands that this repentance can't be superficial. It has to be reflected in the action of the people. Remember what I've always told you, if your faith isn't strong enough to change what you do, you do not have saving faith. So the king says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Without that, everything else is useless. Now, the king wasn't sure that God would forgive them. He certainly hoped that he would. He was doing everything that he could think of to show that he had repented. But he wouldn't know it, but he wouldn't know it until it was, uh, <clears throat> it was doing, uh, what he was doing would work until 40 days later. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he says, who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Today, we don't have to live with that uncertainty. John says, and we confess our sins, and he is faithful to just, just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Well, because the Ninevites had repented, verse 10 says, when God saw what they did, 
how they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Now, does that mean that God changed his mind? Absolutely not. The Ninevites were the ones who changed their mind. And God knew all along the Ninevites were going to do that. He wouldn't be God if he didn't. This is an important lesson concerning prophecies. Some prophecies are absolute. They are going to be fulfilled no matter what. But some prophecies are conditional. They will only be fulfilled if certain conditions are met. Well, Jonah's prophecy failed in, in, falls into that category. When the actions of the king, the nobles, and the people combined to show the sincerity of their repentance, God canceled his plan to bring judgment on the city. That was God's plan all along. But the people of Nineveh won't know for sure that God accepted their repentance until 40 days was up, and they were still there. Showing repentance for 40 days is much more difficult than showing it for 40 hours. As we look back on our own lives, and as well as the lives of various biblical characters, we know that repentance, even for 40 days, doesn't guarantee that that repentance is true or lasting. And that fact is shown in the future history of the Assyrians. In fact, not many years later, the Assyrians would go on to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. So, in 655 B.C., the prophet Nahum pronounced doom on Nineveh, and this time there, were no, there was no reprieve. Nineveh was destroyed in 612 B.C. Just after midnight on September 2nd, 1666, a fire broke out in the bakery of Thomas Foreigner, and it spread throughout the city of London. That's how the Great Fire of London started. It took the people of London four days to extinguish the flames. It destroyed thousands of homes, dozens of church buildings, and a cathedral. Well, one eyewitness of the fire was a Puritan preacher named Thomas Vincent. It inspired him to write a book called Fire and Brimstone in Hell to Burn the Wicked. And that book was published in 1670. Some people feel that the book was what touched off the hellfire and brimstone style of preaching that came a few year, decades later. Well, we can only hope that the uh, practitioners of that style of preaching sincerely want their listeners to repent. But that's more than we can say about Jonah. He resented God's call to preach to the Ninevites, and he resented God every step of the way. He resisted him. He wanted his audience to ignore the message. I would venture a guess that Jonah was the only preacher in history who was upset that the people actually listened to what he had to say. Let me ask you a question. Would you like to see the radical Islamists in the Middle East finally get God's wrath? Or would you like to see them repent and be forgiven? That might give you an idea of what's going through Jonah's mind. Okay, so why do you suppose God did this? This whole thing was designed to show the Israelites that he would do the same thing for them if they would just repent and turn away from their evil ways. So God knew all along that the Ninevites were going to repent, and he responded exactly how he intended to respond. Think about this. No one has ever prayed a prayer that would change God's mind. So if that's true, why pray at all? Well, we pray to acknowledge the fact that God is in charge of all things. So he simply reminded the Ninevites about what happens to unrepentant sinners. Then he gave them all repentant hearts. And then they did exactly what he knew they were going to do. You see, he did this in order to shame the Jews for not bringing God's message to the world. Here we have one flaky preacher named Jonah. He's bringing a whole city to repentance. And it happened in spite of the fact that he was doing everything in his power to stop it from happening. But think about this. Even though Jonah had never lifted a finger to make it happen, God had already used him to bring about a revival on the boat that he was trying to escape on. So Jonah had every right to feel good about himself. After all, the whole city of Nineveh had just repented after hearing his four-word sermon. But Jonah wasn't happy at all. Now admit it, if you spend a day walking through the city of St. Cloud, telling people that they were going to face God's wrath in 40 days, and as a result the whole city repented and came to God, wouldn't you feel pretty good about yourself? Anyway, you look at it, Jonah's mission was a success. But see, he didn't see it that way. Well, what was the secret of Jonah's success? Was he successful because of his superior work ethic or his superior skills? Not hardly. Jonah was a very reluctant missionary. He preached a very half-hearted sermon, and he only spent one day doing it. Jonah was going to do the very least that he could get away with so that God wouldn't put him back inside that fish again. Well, didn't he succeed because he was a great communicator? Are you kidding? 
The sermon was only four words long, translated into English as eight words, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, even though his message was very short, maybe he was successful because it was so captivating. I don't think so. His sermon left out half the information that should have been there. Jonah told the Ninevites that God was going to destroy them in 40 days, but he never told them what they needed to do to avoid God's wrath. His message offered them no hope at all. Even the darkest sermon still needs to point people toward the light. A sermon on judgment should always end with a plea for repentance and an offer of forgiveness. But Jonah's message offered no hope at all. In fact, you can probably hear the snicker in his voice as he said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He probably had a big smile on his face when he said that. The only joy that could be seen in Jonah's message was that Jonah hoped that it would happen and God would destroy the Ninevites in 40 days. He just couldn't wait to see the Ninevites turn into crispy critters. Well, if it wasn't Jonah's work ethic and his communication skills or his captivating message, then what was it that made Jonah's message a success? Simple. In spite of Jonah's reluctance, he still obeyed God. I've said this before, God doesn't require us to be successful, just obedient. All we need to do is obey God and do whatever he tells us to do and then leave the success up to him. Think about this for a moment. Jonah was successful even though he, his obedience was half-hearted. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He tried to get away from God. But after a three-day seminar at the bottom of the ocean, Jonah was ready to go to Nineveh. His attitude stunk, his work ethic was terrible, and his message was repulsive and incomplete, but God still used him. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying for a moment that good attitude, good communication skills, and clear and complete message aren't important because they are. But I think you can see from the scripture passage that Jonah didn't possess any of these things. But he did obey God. He did go to Nineveh. God had to coax him a little, but he did go to Nineveh. And that just goes to prove that if God can use a rascal like Jonah, he can use you too. Remember what Paul said to, when some of the Philippian believers were complaining that there were some preachers in town who were preaching with a, a wrong motive. He said, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from God's will. From The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking of to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. The only thing that God demands from you is obedience. And Jonah was successful because he was obedient. And as long as what the preacher says is true to God's word, God can even use the message that comes from an insincere preacher to accomplish his will. How are you doing? As far as the Ninevites were concerned, they were spared because even though their repentance was short-lived, it was genuine, and they showed it by their actions. Fred had just become a Christian, and he was fully aware of God's forgiving love. But Fred had a good memory, and he could recall things that he had done in the past that were wrong, and his conscience wouldn't let him forget them. Well, Fred set out to make a restitution, and his first step was to an acquaintance in the same town. After being invited in, Fred took some money out of his pocket and handed it to the man, and he said, here, I owe you this money. But the man resisted and told Fred that he didn't owe him anything. Well, Fred explained that many years earlier he had stolen a pig from the man and sold it when he was low in cash. Since this man owned so many pigs, he didn't think that one of them would be missed. And he was right, he wasn't missed. But Fred felt that he needed to make restitution and insisted that the man take the money. Fred also asked for forgiveness for taking advantage of, the, of a friend. And forgiveness was given. Doing that strengthened Fred's relationship with the Lord. You see, repentance is demonstrated by its fruits. This was just as true in the ancient Ninevites as it was for Fred, where's the fruit of your repentance?